ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد we start in the name of God the most high the one to whom belongs all praise the one who controls all affairs the one who gives the one who takes glorified and exalted is he and we send peace and blessings upon the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his family and his followers until the end of time. I mean. <clears throat> We're here at the end of, uh, nearly the end of the month of Rabi al-Awwal, the month wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to bring the last of his messengers, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, into the physical realm. The month wherein the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born, essentially. <coughs> And being in the end of this month, one of the things that <coughs> is on my mind is the role of the Prophet ﷺ as a teacher and the importance of teachers in our lives. And in a number of different narrations, he ﷺ emphasizes this and emphasizes the importance of educating one another uh, and, of, and of his role as an educator. In one narration, the Prophet came into the masjid and he found two groups of people. And he asked, what are these two groups of people doing? And they said, this one, they're sitting and they're remembering God and they're making dua and so on. And they said, this other group, they're reviewing the rules of the religion, of the knowledge of the religion. One is engaging in acts of devotion, one is engaging in acts of education. And the Prophet ﷺ, he went to the latter group and he said, He said, Verily, I was sent as an educator. In many, many hadith, we see this from him. We've also talked about before the hadith where he was giving the khutbah and a man came into the sermon and he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is, I'm a strange man coming from outside of the city who doesn't know his religion. And the Prophet stopped the khutbah and he asked for a stool and they brought a stool and he sat down in front of the man and he began to teach him the basics of the religion. And afterwards he, he finished that and he went back and continued the sermon. So here also we have an indication of his role as an educator. When we look at our own lives, we realize that human beings are creatures of learning. And we learn in all types of different ways. When we talk about learning and we talk about education, we're not just talking about going to a university and getting a degree, or going to a trade school and finishing a program. The Prophet ﷺ, he didn't have a university in the modern sense. He didn't have degrees that people were attaining from him as they were going through that time that they spent with him. But they did learn from him, some along the and we've talked about before how we learn at various capacities and the most fundamental of those capacities is the way that we learn in spending time with one another. And the Prophet Wasallam indicated that this is even possible in our relationship with animals. As we may have talked about before, that he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, uh, that and, and khuyala is from the characteristics of those who are Ashab al-Ibn. People who spend time in the company of camels, they tend to have this kind of like strong and borderline arrogant mentality. And he said, well, وَقَارُ وَالسَّكِينَ فِي أَصْحَابِ الشَّعْرِ And that this uh, dignity and tranquility are the qualities of those who spend time with, with the sheep. So some of the commentators, they said, this indicates to us that even the kind of animals that a person spends time with will actually affect their character. Think about that for a second. Even the kind of animals that a person spends time with will affect their character. This is, of course, 
one of the wisdoms of why the Prophet said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that مَا بَعَثُ اللَّهُ نَبِيًا إِلَّا وَرَعَ الْغَنَمُ that Allah did not send a messenger except that they took care of sheep. They were shepherds. Because there's things that are learned through that process. And so the biggest place that we learn actually is in our engagements with one another. And the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they were raised from one level to the next in their relationship with God and their understanding of creation through the time that they spent with him And this of course is the most important type of education. The degrees are wonderful. Inshallah, they help people to get jobs. They help people to think more accurately and more correctly and so on and so forth. But the most important type of education is the education that teaches us how to be. How should we be? How do we engage with the world? How do we understand our Lord? How do we understand our relationship with creation? How do we understand the rights of others upon us? the rights of the environment upon us. How do we become truly human? This is what the prophets taught. And so this level of education, this kind of education is extremely important. And as we reflect on our own lives, we'll realize that we're taught many different things from many different places, whether or not we realize it. In my own personal life, I think one of the most important decisions that I made in my life was to stop listening to the radio. And oftentimes you'll find people who are very serious about their lives, they don't really spend a whole lot of time watching TV. Because they're learning things. You can, you can appreciate it, you can not appreciate it, you can do whatever. Call me extreme, do whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter. The reality is you watch something and you listen to something over and over and over again, you're learning from it. That's, that's all there is to it. Accept it, don't accept it, conscious about it, unconscious, subconscious about it, but you're learning. So what are we taking then from everything around us? What are the things that we're letting into our hearts? These are important questions. One of the statements of uh, a, a dear friend and a beautiful person, Brother Ali, the poet, he says in one of his poems, we'll just call it that for now, he says in one of his poems, my enemies are not my teachers. My enemies are not my teachers. This also is an important concept, especially for the people who are on the losing end of a particular moment in history. When you're on top, it's easy. Your enemies are not your teachers because you're on top, you're the reference point. But when you're not on top, then your enemies, you start to even subconsciously look up to them. And this is why, you know, you can walk around in many Muslim majority places, and if you dress in traditional Muslim dress, people look down upon you. As if that means that you're uneducated, that means that you don't understand, that means that you don't get reality, you don't understand the modern world, all of these kind of things. Because why? Because our enemies became our teachers. Now that's the standard of what it means to be right. That's the standard of what it means to be educated. That's the standard of what it means to be civilized. That's the standard of what it means to understand the world. Come on. We live in a country that can't get its health care plan together. The richest country that's ever existed probably in all of history. The average person who's not wealthy can't be treated decently in the health care system. That's a disaster. Yeah. Muslims, maybe we didn't have big buildings and tall things and all this kind of stuff. A non-Muslim writer actually said something very interesting about Muslim Spain and Portugal. That the Muslim Spain and Portugal, the level of the education, the level of the intelligence of the people was so high that many of the technological achievements that we have today, they could have actually achieved them. But that wasn't their worldview. Their worldview wasn't efficiency and power and wealth and oppression and domination and who can build the tallest things. Their worldview was a worldview of beauty, of, beauty, of truth, of God. So instead of building the tallest building, you build the most beautiful garden. Or you write the most beautiful poetry. Or you have commentaries and medicine and all of these kind of things that occur. Right? Because why? Because these are people that understood when you unlock the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rules that we have in nature, that we have in creation, these are the rules that Allah has put in creation. And the people who believe in God understand that you cannot approach the rules that God has put in creation 
without the sunnah of the Prophet Otherwise you have destruction. So you can make all of the advancements and the condition of human beings will not be advanced. Because the sunnah of God must be approached through the sunnah of the Messenger of God. He's the one who taught us that. He's the one who taught us how to be. How to balance between the spiritual, the intellectual, the physical, the, the relationship between our food and how our hearts feel, the relationship between our greed and how it affects the world around us. This is the Prophet taught us how to put all of these things in balance. But instead, we take our enemies as our teachers. So our en- my enemies are not my teachers. The Prophet ﷺ, his enemies were not his teachers. He didn't adopt the politics and the tactics and the strategies of the people who were oppressing him. He was wise. He had strategy. He planned. But he has his own values and his own ethics, inspired by the divine and lived out in the, his in his example, You see this then through the people who inherited his way. And you, this actual exact statement of my enemies are not my teachers, the meaning of it repeats itself over and over again. <clears throat> the Prophet when they came to Medina, him and Abu Bakr he was in such a humble state that the people of Medina who didn't know the Prophet ﷺ mistook Abu Bakr for the Prophet ﷺ. That's his way. So Umar ibn Khattab and the Muslims conquered Jerusalem. And the Patriarch of Jerusalem invites them and tells them, I will only hand over the keys to the ruler of this people. So Umar ibn Khattab he comes all the way to Jerusalem on a donkey with his clothes that's tattered and has patches in it. And he comes into the city, this is the leader of these people. Because he cares about the sunnah of the Prophet. He came into the area of Masjid al Aqsa. He found that it was being used as a garbage heap. Imagine. So, how, what did he do? He cleaned it up himself. That's, that's, that's leadership. He cleaned it up himself. Cleaned it up, then it became, they put the basic foundations for Masjid al Aqsa, Allah created from its occupation and the oppression that the people who lived there. That's Omar. Later on, when the Crusaders come and they conquer Jerusalem and they literally slaughter everybody, it's not an exaggeration. They slaughter the Muslims, they slaughter the Eastern Christians, they slaughter any Jews in the area. They even killed animals. Like they were really horrific things. Less than a hundred years later when Salah al-Din reconquers Jerusalem for the Muslims. And he's negotiating the leaving of the Crusader armies from Jerusalem back to Europe. And he tells them, you have safe passage. Just leave the city. You have safe passage all the way back to Europe. We're not going to harass you. The leader of the army, he told them, when we conquered this city, we slaughtered everybody. And Salah al-Din told them, I am not those men. You see the same, my enemies are not my teachers. He said, I am not those men. And then they went to Masjid al-Aqsa, and Masjid al-Aqsa again was in rubbish, and was dirty, and was not taken care of, and so on and so forth. And he went with his soldiers, and they cleaned it up themselves. Again, same thing. They cleaned it up themselves. And they prayed in Masjid al-Aqsa the next Friday. Allah Omar al the... <coughs> Libyan freedom fighter, when some of his uh, soldiers captured some of the Italians and they wanted to torture them, they wanted to kill them, they wanted to do different things to them. And he told them no. And they said, that's what they do to us when they capture us. And he said the exact phrase, they are not our teachers. This is in the recent history. They are not our teachers. Who is our teacher? Who is it that we actually learn from? how it is that we are supposed to be. So the enemies is one side. But you know, like they say in the, in the, the proverb, people say, with, fr- with friends like these, who needs enemies? With friends like these, who needs enemies? Where's our second problem when it comes to teachers? It's ourselves. Too many people don't know when they should just close their mouth. That's the reality of the Muslim community. 
I know it's a harsh one. Nobody wants to hear it. We do a lot of harm to ourselves when it comes to what we tell each other about religion. Honestly, I deal with a lot of young people, as many of you know. And I deal with a lot of communities in a lot of different places. And the things that I hear that people are taught from Muslims about Islam, I'm absolutely amazed that people are still Muslims. It baffles me. Like, how are you still... <laughs> like, I want you to still be here. <laughs> you know? like, we want people to remain Muslim. But how are you still Muslim? Like, this is what you were taught? This is what you were told in religion is? This is what you were told this way is all about? That's what you were told, really? And you're still here? Because people know in the depth of their heart that God exists. That's the truth. But the wrong teachers are in the wrong place. And this is a very, very dangerous thing. Because to really teach what it means to be, which is the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, what is his way? How was he? It doesn't only take correct knowledge. Right, correct knowledge is step one. We actually usually fall on step one. But correct knowledge is part of it. But also the second part of it is the wherewithal to do something about that knowledge. So not only do I have to know really truly who is God, not only do I have to know really truly who is the Prophet and how that plays out in life, but I also have to have the spiritual wherewithal to appropriately deal with that. So that I'm not using religion, for example, to control my children. Or to abuse my spouse. Or to look down on other people. Or to fill my heart with arrogance and oppression and disgustingness and envy and hatred and all of these kind of things that people fill their hearts with in the name of religion. Which is a total, this complete blasphemy. But this also is another side. Who are my teachers? If the Prophet وسلم, is my teacher, and he is my means by which I know what Allah wants from me, who is it that's between me and the Prophet That's a question that Muslims used to care about. Right? From very early on, in Isnad and Medin, the, the, narrow, the chain, Isnad literally means what you lean up against. What, what's the domino that you're leaning up against all the way back to Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That's an important question. One of, one of the American Muslim scholars, he says that uh, Islam, Muslims are a cult of authenticity. Not in a negative sense. A cult of authenticity meaning we really care whether something is true. Is this truly representative of the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or not? Where is it coming from? Am I taking my religion from people who took it? Ed bin Anjad, all the way back to the Prophet Generation after generation after generation, not only this is the rule, and this is what we say in theology or in fiqh or whatever, but what is it supposed to look like? And we beat each other over the heads. The rules, the rules are not there to like worship the rules all the time. The rules are there to show us the, the route that we're supposed to take so we can become who we are supposed to be. So that the way of the religion can be what it's supposed to be. So that the hearts can become what they are supposed to become. Not just so that we can beat all the rules in the right place. So who are the teachers? Again, and the Prophet ﷺ said, again, that he was sent as a teacher. So we have the challenge of our enemies as our teachers. And we have the challenge of the wrong teachers amongst us as our teachers. Uh, this is also a, a very serious challenge. Uh, the, the false teacher in many cases in religion is actually, it's like on par with, with shaitan. It's very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. And we ask a lot to protect us. Inshallah, in the second half, we'll talk about a little bit more in close. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
She didn't say, well, you know, God, you speak to me. I'm good to go. I don't need to. I mean, imagine. We think we're good to go. We probably can't even read Fatiha properly. Many people probably don't know the difference between what's required in wudu and what's recommended in wudu. Most people. <laughs> and Musa, alayhi salam, God speaks to him. He finds out someone has knowledge that he doesn't have. He's like, let's do nothing. Let's go. I'm going to go find this person. I'm going and still I find it. That's it. And then he finds the person, he says, Can I not? Is it possible that I can follow you so that you can teach me that which you were given from knowledge, from guidance? Hey, this, is, this is a really profound story, the story of the text. And you see that, of course, generation upon generation upon generation of the Muslims. So the last point then is to recognize that we need people like that in our lives. The Prophet ﷺ has promised us that there will be true inheritors of his way until the end of time. This, the people will inherit, upright people will inherit this religion, the knowledge of this religion, generation after generation. It will be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us their company. O oh Allah, forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, accept from us our deeds, enter us into paradise, and accept from us all of our efforts. Allah, we ask you to send abundant peace and blessings upon Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give him our salam. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give him our salam. Allah, we ask you to give us knowledge that benefits us and to benefit us from that which you have taught us. Allah, we ask you to give food to those who are hungry, to give shelter to those who are shelterless, to give victory to those who are oppressed. Allah, we ask you to bring life to our hearts and to give us teachers and, and mentors and guides who can help us to understand truly what you want from us, Ya Allah. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give us the company of righteous people, people who seek you and nothing else, people who love your messenger and who love good and love to do good for others. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma khiruna dhunubana wa sarafana ka imna wa qadr sa qadamana. Allahumma barik fina wa bayna wa la fina kulubina wa sifufina. Allahumma kun ma'ana wa la tukun alayna. Unsu wa ikhwana wa sala'afina fi kulimika. Nisa alayna wa fitah ya ameen. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزلنا عمل وعمل صالحا اللهم تقبل منا وعفع عنا وعاتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة في حسنة وفينا على النار وصلى الله عليه وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليم كثيرا وفي مصر